Uh, before uh, we get started, I want to read a, a few scriptures and uh, uh, go through uh, uh, some of them, not all of them. Uh, Psalm 127, a well-known psalm to many. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now I read from the King James uh, translation. I still like the poetry of it, uh, but uh, you can follow along in whatever translations you have. Uh, I do use other translations in my study, but in public reading, I still enjoy uh, that uh, poetic charm of the King James. And to the New Testament, uh, two passages that we are going to consider uh, with greater focus. One, of course, is uh, Ephesians chapter 6 the book that uh, has been the working text for the conference. Ephesians 6 and verse 1 reads, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And if fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And one more, if you will permit me, uh, Colossians and chapter 3, two verses out of there. The third chapter of Colossians and chapter, uh, verse 20, children, Obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Let's uh, bow for a word of prayer uh, before we consider the word. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us together in this fashion. We thank you for your design and uh, purpose for our lives as individual believers, for us as uh, couples, as families, to advance your interests and your purposes in our lives and in our world. So as we have your word open before us, we pray that um, that which we do not understand, you will teach us. That which we do not have, you will give us. And that which we are not, that you will make us. Help us to be humble before your word. Help us to be an encouragement one to another. We ask this in the name and for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, just uh, uh, as a matter of, I know everybody here is a child. Um, how many here are children but not parents? Anybody of that? Okay, there's one, two hands, okay. Um, I know there is at least one group with uh, children and parents here. Children and parents. 
Your, your, your children are here as well? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, family is a, is a wonderful idea. Uh, God thought of it. He designed it. And he gave uh, instructions about it. And um, what we are going to do is a little study on family life. And uh, the particular focus here is going to be on that sense of the family that uh, includes parents and children. And the relationship that exists between them that uh, we have responsibility for. Um, a study on family is kind of an ongoing thing, isn't it? <clears throat> you just cannot do a study on family in 59 minutes at a conference. Those of you who have grown up in your own families as children and now have become adults and maybe parents, you know that the study has been going on for a long time. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think about family, I study about families, and um, in preparing for this, I looked at some passages. And um, even if you're not a speed reader, you can read pretty much everything that is a specific instruction about family life in a very short period of time, maybe 10 minutes or less. That's if you're a little bit slow reading. So you have, when you think about families, you have specific instructions. And we read some of them. You have principles about family life that uh, may be given to us, not so much saying this is for the family, but these are principles of Christian life that have specific applications for the family. Well, we heard this morning about um, uh, the Christian's behavior, how he should walk. And you can take the principles that we find in Ephesians 4 and 5 and really apply it to things like kindness, forgiveness, serving. Because family life is enriched when people are kind to each other and can forgive each other and do serve each other in love. So direct commands, instructions, there are principles, but then you can also study about family by looking at um, families in Scripture. You know, I'd, I'd call it a case study approach. And particularly in the Old Testament, God tells us about all kinds of families. There are families into which the Lord takes us. He pulls the curtain back and he lets us see in. All kinds of stuff. Stuff that you wouldn't be proud of if it were happening in your family. Okay. But these are given as examples to us, aren't they? And if time permits, and if I'm a good steward of the time, maybe I'll have a quick glimpse at one or two uh, toward the end. Now, God is a God of order. So he's got an order for the created universe. He's got uh, an order for the church in how we should behave ourselves in the church of God. And God has an order for the family. And uh, the order for the family is given not to restrict us, uh, to limit us, uh, but the order given about the family is given so that we may live uh, freely, joyfully, fruitfully. And when things are out of order, we have dysfunction. 
And uh, I think, you know, if you, if you are at all paying any attention to the chatter that goes on about us, you know, everybody is talking about, you know, I come from a dysfunctional family, or so-and-so has got a dysfunctional family. And I hear it all the time, and if I had a dime for every time I heard it, uh, I could be retired now. Uh, but, but the reality is that um, all of human family is in some state of disorder and dysfunction because of the effect of sin. So, but God is always restoring order into the family. And so we have these ordered relationships for family life. Now, you know, we, we all love our families for the most part, at least most days. Yeah. Having families is, is stressful. Uh, you know, I don't know if, you know, every year they kind of come up with numbers about how much, it, how much money it takes to raise a child. You, you read up on those things? You know, $250,000 or something for a child. Uh, we raised two. I don't know if it costs that much, but uh, well, it, it, it is costly. Um, so having families is stressful. It's not just financial stress. Um, the stress of managing human relationships. Because, um, you know, all of us who make up our families, we are people. And uh, people, one of the problems with people is that people are like people. And, 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 and they behave like people. Um, so I'm sure there are times when uh, you say, you know, why don't I have their children? You know, they seem to be so well behaved and uh, they are so polite and they always say, excuse me, sorry, thank you. Why don't I have their children? And, you know, and probably their parents are saying, why don't I have, you know, I wonder if we could do a child swap, you know. Johnny Cash. Uh, some of you may recognize that name. He was a country singer. And uh, he and one of his sons was having, having a go at it. And uh, uh, they were really... Uh, uh, throwing it back and forth, and, uh, and in utter exasperation, the son says, you know, I never asked to be brought into this world. And Mr. Cash pauses for a moment, and he says, it's a good thing you didn't, because if you had, I would have said no. <laughs> yeah. So it can be... Uh, painstaking at times. It's hard work. But I think, you know, uh, all that uh, humor aside, I want those of us who are parents to really get a hold of this idea that having and raising children is a stewardship. Okay? Children are not our possession that I get and I'm, I'm free to do whatever I want to do with this person that is under my care for a short time, to direct them to my purposes, my intentions, my ends, my goals, to make a ma name for myself and all of that. Raising, having and raising children is a stewardship. And if you got nothing else out of this, I pray that you will be able to go getting a hold of that idea. That your children are a stewardship from God. And if so, what is required of stewards in all situations will be required of us in the stewardship of being parents. And that is being faithful. 
Okay. Stewardship, and therefore, it requires faithfulness. Now, within the family, when you think about looking at the family biblically, there are several relationships that come together. There's, first of all, at the center is the relationship of the husband and the wife. It comes before children, and it remains after children are grown and gone. Okay. So in the mind of God, the relationship of the husband and wife is central. So when children come, and I, I hear this all, a lot of times, you know, well, things were going pretty well, and then we started having kids and everything kind of, you know, the wheels started to come off. And I want to say to them that when God thought of children, he thought the best, safest, most fruitful place into which, bring children, into which to bring children is into the care of a husband and wife who are committed to each other. Okay? So there is that order in Genesis, isn't there? First there is marriage, and then comes children. So when Adam and Eve started having children, there was no wringing of hands going on in heaven. What, <laughs> what are we going to do now? Their, their, their marriage is now doomed. So be encouraged. Children are safe with you, and they are not a threat to the marriage. They are, your marriage is there, children, they leave, the marriage still remains. And God uses the marriage for important object lessons, um, like husband, wife, Christ church. So it's a very primary and foremost relationship. So there is a relationship of the husband and the wife. Second in the family is the relationship of children to parents and parents to children. And if you think about it, the family is the most determinative unit in any society. Christian, non-Christian, ancient, modern, Eastern, West, it doesn't matter. Family is at the core of the health and well-being of any society. And when the family begins to disintegrate, society pays a price. So as Christians, we have even a more um, important uh, responsibility in terms of, uh, of, this, of this stewardship. Now, when you think about all kinds of things we do as Christians, um, there are things we do that, that, that are good and, and godly things for which we have no direct instructions on how to do it. Uh, the last I checked, there is no instruction in the Bible about how to conduct IBF. You know, we have good men who labor in it and they do a tremendous job, but, uh, you know, there is... There's nothing like what I read at the beginning that you can read about conferences or about Sunday schools. But when it comes to living in our families, God has instructions, specific ones. Uh, managing these very complex relationships and roles and behaviors but they're all given in just a few words, as I said at the start. Uh, but it takes uh, a lifetime to practice. All right, the passage in Ephesians, I guess that's where I should uh, have you turn now. Now, there is an outline in the, uh, in the conference booklet, and uh, I will probably need to tell you that I'm not going to touch on all of what's in there, and uh, I'm going to probably say some things that are not in there, 
uh, but the outline, I, I, I take responsibility for it, uh, but it is there for your help. Uh, we may not go through it point by point. The instruction given in Ephesians 6 with parallel in Colossians 3 is coming in the midst of instructions given to a husband and wife in chapter 5. And it is followed by instructions to masters and slaves. So this is all about uh, the Christian's life in society, in the home, in the workplace, in having and raising children. And if you read the Ephesian passage, you will notice that even before the instructions to the wife is given or the husband is given, to the children is given, Paul gives another instruction, and that is the instruction about being filled with the Spirit. Okay, that's, that's, that's where actually things begin in, in, in uh, this whole series of relationships. And I think, you know, the implication uh, that I find in it is that if we are going to be fulfilling these things that Paul is writing about, whether it is how the husband is to behave, how the wife is to behave, how children are to behave, how parents are to behave, we cannot do this just from our own natural bent and inclinations. See, often when we think about uh, uh, being filled with the Spirit, you know, we, we pray for uh, the brother taking the pulpit for preaching the Word. Or we, we talk about this when we are sending a missionary overseas into some foreign land. Uh, or some uh, evangelistic outreach that we believe we need to have the Spirit's help. Uh, when was the last time you remember praying that God's Spirit will fill you so that you will know how to love your wife and how to bring up your children? And if you are a child, how to be obedient to your parents? You get what I'm getting at? That this is a spiritual exercise. Domestic relationships for the Christian is a spiritual exercise. And if so, we need spiritual enablement. So it's a stewardship, and it's a stewardship for which we need the help of the Spirit to carry it out. Now some of the details. Children are to obey your parents in the Lord. And he says, for this is right. Now, obedience to parents. It's not an exclusively Christian idea. Because non-Christian cultures highlight this, they expect it. Um, the Greeks and the Romans, pagans to the core, they had expectations about children being obedient to parents. Asian cultures, Japan, China, Taiwan, all of these places, if you have friends, uh, talk to them, and uh, for them, this idea of obedience to parents, to authority, is a very central thing in the way how society is organized. So for the Christian, it is even a greater responsibility, obedience to parents. And when you read like Romans 1, um, before the law was given, and certainly before the epistles were written, there was a natural law that is written within the human heart that informed the mind that obedience to parents was the proper thing. And that's what Paul is saying in Ephesians 6. Obey your parents because it is it is right. It, it's the right thing to do. It's right or it is righteous. Okay? 
He's not even appealing yet in that verse to the revealed law which we have in the Ten Commandments where there is specific instruction about obeying parents. So even before that came about, obedience to parents was a natural law written on the human heart. And when Paul writes in Romans 1, decadent societies began to ignore what was written on the human heart. They became disobedient to parents. Okay. And in Paul's letter to Timothy, he would come back to this idea that in the latter days, one of the things that would happen is that children will be disobedient to parents. And with that comes disrespect. And have you ever seen a child behaving disrespectfully toward a parent, to authority? Oh, I have. I, I have proof. This, this came in, um, in the Wall Street Journal. I, I, I just read it for these human interest stories. I, all the economic stuff and the, the graph and the chart, MBAs can figure that one out. Uh, here is uh, uh, a mom with uh, her son at the doctor's office. The child is sick, has not gone to school for several days, and Kyle was absorbed in a video game on his cell phone. So I asked his mom, this is a pediatrician, how long has Kyle had a stomach ache? Mom said, I'm thinking it's been about two days. And then Kyle replied, shut up, mom. You don't know what you're talking about. And uh, uh, Dr. Sachs keeps on writing, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a read. And, um, and he's recommending, I don't think he's a Christian, I don't, I don't know what he believes, but he's recommending things like uh, have face-to-face -face conversations with your children. Don't sign them up for a lot of things. Eat, eat, eat dinner with them. Okay? Um, so disobedience to parents, disrespect, is, is rampant. You know, you, you think about why we are having so much problem with uh, uh, police having so much trouble with uh, people that are misbehaving. Because no one has respect for authority. Here is another one from the Wall Street. Now, I don't know, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of somewhat, you know, I'm, I'm old enough and gray enough that I'm kind of like an uncle now, you know. Uh, I, by Ben Matthew, I'm almost an apogee now because I got <laughs> gray hair now. Uh, but, you know, I, I have occasionally come across someone who would refer to his parent uh, by first name. But I get it because I'm talking with people of a little bit off the track, you know. Uh, I thought maybe that was just kind of a disordered kind of thing. But this is more standard. Children put mom and dad on a first name basis. Uh, this was written October 29, 2015. Uh, here is uh, Hayden Mathias digs for her buzzing iPhone and taps the FaceTime icon. Now, this is all about, I mean, this is, we are on, you know, this is like smartphone age, you know. You can use a phone for anything but a phone call. You know, I sometimes tell you, I tease young people, you know, if that thing ever rang, would you know what to do? Okay. And so here is this uh, teenage girl uh, tapping the FaceTime icon and goes, Oh, hey, Dave. And the tall, blonde-haired eighth grader says to the face falling her, filling her screen, Is it a boyfriend, a slacker biology lab partner? Guess again. Dave is Hayden's dad. And then it goes on and gives four other scenarios. And these are all, and one of the dads says, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't care if she calls me by my first name. If she calls me anything, I'm just happy. Okay? Children, 
Now, against the background of these, listen to Paul's words again. Children, obey your parents. You know, God knew what he was doing, didn't he? So we need to rediscover this stewardship. Because when we raise our children in such a way that they grow up as kids who can obey, honor, and respect parents, we are really helping them do something that pleases God. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Children, obey your parents, okay? Because it is right. And then the next step that Paul takes is to say, verse 2, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now he is going into revealed will of God. Before it was natural law. Now it is revealed law. Okay. God thought enough about it when he gave Moses these Ten Commandments, which was to order the life of God's ancient people, he saw fit to put it in there that children should honor, regard, respect their parents. So natural law, revealed law. And the third argument that uh, Paul has, and for that we need to go into Colossians. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. Most of what we find in these two passages are very similar in idea. So when you look at two passages that are similar in ideas, it's an important thing to look at what's different about these two passages that do have similar ideas but what stands out that's different. In Colossians, um, Paul says, um, Obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And in Ephesians, what Paul is saying is, you know, obey your parents in the Lord. Now we have come from natural law, to reveal law to now God's saving intervention. It is in the Lord. So it is maybe a, a safe thing to think that uh, Paul has in mind children who are in the Lord. They are those who have trusted him. So if you imagine the Ephesian letter being read on a Lord's day, as the church gathered to remember the Lord and to worship Him and to be instructed in the Word, here comes a word from Paul. It is being read. So, you know, husbands hear their bit, wives hear their bit, children hear their bit about what they're supposed to do. This is now Christian ethics. This is something that the Lord expects of you. Okay? This is in the Lord, in, in your relationship to Him, in your union and communion with Him, you do this, and uh, it's pleasing to the Lord. Now, I should make a, a little side note here. If we treat all of what we read as the Word of God, then the things that are told the wife that she should do, if she obeyed, it's pleasing to the Lord. If the things that the husband is charged to do, if he did it, it is pleasing to the Lord. And if children did what they are commanded to do, it's pleasing to the Lord. And if parents did what they are instructed to do, because they are all acts of obedience. You, you follow me? It's not just children who are to obey. Parents are to obey the word of the Father in heaven. So every relationship addressed has instruction in it given by God 
and our obedience is actually ultimately an obedience to Him, and it pleases Him. And that should be good reason, shouldn't it? You know, if I really knew that something that I did would please God, I would want to do it, wouldn't I? Okay. So, three arguments that Paul makes. One from natural law, one from revealed law, and third from God's saving intervention. Okay, let me... Oh, wow. Okay. Let me take a moment here, and I'm, I'm kind of talking on, and I know it's... Uh, any questions or comments at this point? Um, Should children obey their grandparents? You say it's only the parents. Well, I think... Um, it's, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, I think there are other, instru- I think honoring is something that, because, you know, we, we need to, you know, because when you say children obey your parents, you know, how, how far does that go? Is it uh, until they are five, until they are 15, until they are 21? Um, I think at, at some point, I think, Obedience shifts to honor. Okay? And I think, you know, we have other places to which we can turn in Scripture, and uh, if we get there, I'll, I'll give you maybe a, a verse or two. Honoring parents, I think, is what is expected of Christian children after they have become more independent in terms of decisions and choices. Um, you know, when I'm talking to my adult children, I'm not talking in terms of obedience. Because I'm, I'm praying that uh, when I had them under my care, I've been helping them grow and mature in the things of God, so that when they become individuals who are kind of carrying on in the world, I don't need to keep instructing them. God's saving intervention in terms of our saving relationship to God through Christ. That, uh, specifically right, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. But I think, you know, respect and honor. And I think, you know, Paul writing to Timothy uh, would instruct about that in chapter 3, I believe, of First uh, Timothy. Uh, but we will, we will come to it. Now, when it says uh, that you may live long on the earth, uh, and it may be well with thee, and so on and so forth, uh, we, we don't want to misunderstand the passage to mean that uh, if you obey your parents and live well, then, you know, you're going to live to 90. I don't, I don't think that means that. Um, but I think, you know, what it means is, uh, at a minimum, that as a people, when our lives are marked by disobedience, uh, the consequences are such that there is a disintegration that takes place. So it's not kind of a one-to-one correspondence, because there are some very obedient children who get uh, leukemia uh, and die at 10 not because they've been disobedient, but simply Paul's idea is that, um, you know, your life is going to be enriched, whether it is to 15 or 55 or 85, if you are seeking to please God in carrying out these instructions given in the context of family life. Okay. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, I'm very, I'm very to the by itself, from the very childhood that was the respect and honor of the parents and the elders uh, that I've been taught, you are quite 
acquire that skills, I felt very angry to respect the parents and honor the elders. And it, it's, it's maybe it's changing now in the 21st century, but the way I grew up was always there without the Bible. That is uh, Hindu culture. Now when I go to uh, Christian culture, Christian community, although as an Indian Christian, you have the same, but at the same time it's different within the church context. Uh, I find it a uh, little bit difficult to see that the children do not acquire the skills to respect honor of the others. Mm -hmm. uh, which may have some negative uh, results when they grow up to be. Yeah, and I think, you know, so when, when, when Paul says, so that it may be well with you, uh, I think uh, the, the opposite is, is also true, that, uh, you know, having a lifestyle of disregard and disobedience and uh, lack of respect for authority uh, will have its own consequences. Now, um, the Spirit of God is very well balanced in this. It's not just the obedience of children that is emphasized. Uh, then there is a word to the parents. Okay? Now, if, if you are like I am, you know, I'm, I'm always looking at uh, what the responsibility of the other. You know, I, I came to know what the responsibilities of the wife are a long before I started to pay attention to what the husband is supposed to do, you know. <laughs> I, I know all of those verses about what the wife is supposed to do. <laughs> I, I sometimes, when I uh, talk to men, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, my, you know, my problem is that my wife does not submit to me. And I say, well, that may be a problem, but that may not be the only problem. So I sometimes, you know, I want you to look at these verses that's talking about the husband. I, I also want you not to look at what the Spirit of God is saying to the wife. Let her worry about it, okay? Uh, you're not commanded to make sure that she submit, okay? So parents are given some instructions, and they have something to obey too, you see? Children are not the only one commanded to obey. Parents. Because if this is a command, then it is meant to be obeyed, right? I mean, isn't that self-explanatory? Now, parents, uh, it's, it's um, remarkable what it says. Provoke not your children. Now, what does it mean to provoke a child? Has anybody done that? Parents? Okay. I, I don't want you to raise your hands or do anything, you know, just be honest within yourself. You can do that, right? Just, just within yourself. So it's, it's so easy to provoke. Now, without making any confessions, what does it mean to provoke a child? Anger? Okay. To be unreasonable and disciplining them. Okay. Unreasonableness. That's the, that's, the out, that's the effect, okay? That's the effect of it. Well, enforcing your will without thinking. Okay. So, agitating them, uh, making unreasonable demands, uh, constant criticisms, constant instructions, abuse. You know, have you been, uh, have you observed parents who, within a span of five minutes, issue 50 instructions? Don't do that. Don't do that. Put that, don't, come, no. And the child is not minding any of it, okay? And, and then the child, uh, father gets exact. I'm going, I'm saying it for the hundredth time. Uh, and I go, why are you saying anything a hundred times? So, unreasonable instructions. You know, children are rebellious, but not everything a child does is a rebellious act. Pardon me? Favoritism, Favoritism yeah. We, we have a great example of that in uh, Genesis. 
uh, 26, I think, you know, if that's my case study, if you ever get to it. But if I don't get to it, go home and read Genesis 26. You have favoritism, you have parents that uh, are not talking to each other, and uh, it's, it's a mess. You know, it was a very bad hair day uh, for Isaac <laughs> and Rebecca. Oh, it was terrible. But when in the New Testament, uh, in Hebrews, the Holy Spirit wants to really talk about the faith of Isaac, that is exactly the place to which he goes. So that's, that's a different exposition. I don't want to get into it now. So provoking your children is forbidden. Okay? And if the Spirit of God says, parents, do not provoke your children, it is very possible that they could. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit will not issue an instruction not to do that. The Holy Spirit is very conservative in what he says. So if something didn't need to be said, he wouldn't say it. So the possibility that we could provoke our children, making demands on them that are unreasonable. Okay? Uh, just because I want them to be something going at it time after time, every opportunity I get. I'm pressing it, pressing it, pressing it. Sarcasm. Put downs. Ridicule. Shaming them to do things. These are all ways in which we can provoke our children, and it's a serious thing, okay? Um, Colossians, in Colossians, Paul says, don't do it lest they be discouraged. We can do that to children, you know, really kill their spirit, their natural confidence to do things. We can really suppress it. Now, God's Spirit is very balanced. He not only says things to children and parents to balance it, but even in what he says to the parents, there is a balance. Do not provoke. That's the negative aspect of the command. But then there is positive. You know, if, if all through my parenting career, I manage not to provoke my ch child or my children, I still haven't done my job. Well, that's tough, isn't it? I just went through another day and I didn't provoke my child one bit. And the Spirit of God says, you know, the job isn't done yet. Do not provoke your children. Rather, or instead, what? Bring them up. In all the reading that I've done in Scripture, I've never found a place where children are instructed to bring themselves up. And my fear is that there are a lot of children who are left bringing themselves up. Okay. Uh, in terms of um, what they do after school, in terms of just care and attention, they're bringing themselves up. And, um, and sometimes, I, and I think, you know, the society has, you know, th th there's so many things that children can do these days. You know, there is before school activities, during school activities, after school activities. So, you, you know, you, you wake up your child at 5.30 and you're taking them to travel soccer practice in the morning and then off they go to school and then they have swim meet after that and then piano lessons and then there is hockey and then 10 o'clock the child comes crashing in. Now, who is raising them? So I sometimes get very distraught parents and I, I, I try to find out what, what their day looks like, and I, I, I start to feel exhausted just listening to what their day is like. So, here, here is an uncle, 
giving advice. Don't sign up your children for everything that's going on. They don't need all that. Okay. Because one of the, no, if you want to get principles, here is a principle. The principle that scripture tells us in Christian living is that he cannot have it all. Fair enough? There are some things we have to give up to get a hold of some other things. So it is the stewardship of parents to wisely and prayerfully decide what are the things that that are going to be my child's life and what things are not. Bring up children, and uh, then there are two words. If I get too far away from the podium, I'll miss my clock here. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Two words. Obviously, they do not mean the same thing. Otherwise, the Spirit of God would not use two words. You know, if he could use... Holy Spirit is not like a Puritan, you know. About the Puritans, it is said they'll never use two words where they could use four. Have you read some Puritan writers? I mean, you know, they, they're full of words. He uses two words. One is nurture, and the other is admonition. Um, nurture is uh, kind of like a, a word that has to do with training, education. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually the word from which we have the English word pediatrics. Okay. This is what parents do, which includes chastening, correction, uh, what uh, Proverbs would use, you know, using the rod uh, to discipline a child. Uh, actually, the same word is used about the father chastening the son whom he loves in Hebrews 12. Okay. So this is part of uh, how the father, the father, does child training. He nurtures us. Admonition is more uh, having to do with words, exhorting, um, reasoning with children. So both are needed. It's not uh, one to the neglect of the other, and maybe uh, I don't want to get into a discussion about uh, is, it, is it proper to spank your kid and all of that. You know, you, you know the answer. Um, but I think, you know, maybe at some point, you need to start engaging their minds. Okay? Uh, when, when your child is 17, you don't want to resort to, I'm going to go for the ruler now, you know. You, you should have better methods by now. And uh, engaging their mind in conversation about reasons why. E even, even God does that with us, doesn't he? When he disciplines, there is reasons given. Okay. Now, when we have uh, done our job, uh, what do we get? Well, uh, let's uh, turn to First Timothy 3. Now, 1 Timothy 3 is talking in, in this passage about, uh, you know, uh, qualifications, uh, if you want to call it that, of um, someone who would rule uh, in the house of God. It's talking about uh, who, who can be an elder uh, among the flock of God. And uh, in it, uh, Paul says, verse 4, one that ruleth his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Um, now, here is a question. If that is what should be the children of uh, one who would aspire to be an elder, uh, that's what children should be like, should it be any different for any other believer? Let's see. 
I, I don't think elders are a separate class. Yeah, yeah I mean, if somebody's going to rule the house of God, yeah, they, they should have children who are in subjection and uh, grave, it says, serious-minded, uh, reverent. That's what that word means. So I think, you know, that we, we can get a clue from that as to what is going to be the fruit of all our stewardship in the area of family life, of uh, raising children, that we will have children who are well-governed. And it, 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 it answers to the whole idea of bring them up, okay? When you bring up your children, you're going to have children who grow up who are ruled well. They're governed. They are reverent. They're godly. They are serious about uh, things that are serious. And they also are uh, grateful children. Um, <clears throat> Uh, chapter 5 of First Timothy. Again, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling out a, a, a section that is actually talking about uh, taking care of uh, certain groups of people in the church, okay? Uh, in this case, widows. Uh, verse 4 of chapter 5 of First Timothy, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite or pay back, give something back, their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now here we are coming into the question of honoring. So this is not obedience necessarily, but this is the way that a well-governed, grave, now, when I say the word grave, that's, king, that's the trouble with using King James. <laughs> when, when you hear the word grave, you're thinking about the cemetery. Uh, that's not what that grave is. It's about being a serious, reverent child. That kind of a child will be one who would honor his parent in his old age. Okay. One last uh, a note before we break for prayer. You know, among other things, uh, one of the things I think we should be teaching our children through this whole bringing them up is the skills, the ability to think and to think godly, to think biblically, to be able to make decisions that are consistent with the character of God and the mind of God, to be able to evaluate things. Okay. Now, back in the book of Numbers and uh, chapter 32, we won't take time to read it, uh, but you can go home and read it. Um, there are two tribes as uh, the children of Israel are getting resettled. There are two tribes that come to Moses, and they are on the on this side of the Jordan, uh, and they don't want to go in. And they say, you know, can, can you arrange for our, our settlement to be this side of Jordan? Because as we were coming through, we noticed that uh, this place is really, this is really great for cattle. Okay. This, is, this is just the place. If you're going to raise cattle, this is the place to be. And by golly, we've got cattle. And this is a good place for cattle. We have cattle. Can we have our inheritance this side of Jordan? And if you keep reading down, down to about verse 17 of chapter 32, it says, as they are settling down, they are having to build walled cities within the city for their children because the inhabitants were terrible. Okay? So here they are trying to make a decision about where to settle down based on what's good for cattle, but it is terribly bad for children. Now, you can imagine what that does to the child in terms of learning to evaluate things, to make decisions. 
So as parents, we have a great responsibility and opportunity to train up young minds to think properly, to think biblically, to think Christianly, to think with eternal realities in view. And if we succeed in doing that by the grace of God, we will have given them an inheritance that would be of great value to them and to society at large. May God the Holy Spirit, who fills and equips us, fill us to do this in terms of our stewardship in family life.